Hey everyone, welcome to the channel of Rationality. And today I've got something to give to you all. Really useful tool. So I hear the phrase conspiracy theory thrown out regularly when you're actually discussing geopolitical intrigue and, you know, data and science. And it's quite frustrating. And I'm sure many of you may have felt the same. And it occurred to me that I can separate a conspiracy theory, like something ridiculous or fanciful, uh, from an actual kind of underhand intrigue, you know, corporate or whatever, uh, quite easily. And I actually took the time to set down a series of uh, elements on a checklist where anyone, even without my kind of experience in complex problem solving and data and all that, anyone can actually go through and check off six key items and be able to answer the question with near certainty as to whether something being discussed is a conspiracy theory or, or is actually a kind of old-fashioned conspiracy or collusion or confluence of interests driving uh, some kind of profiteering or something nasty. So let's get straight into it. So I hope you like the new splash screen format I threw together. But anyway, let's get on to the tool. So here it is, and I'm going to go through it, and I'm sure you're going to find it really useful, and also to help you articulate why something is not to be brushed off as a conspiracy theory, and, and that's a really useful thing, and also not to fall into the trap of believing a conspiracy theory yourself. So here it is, the ultimate ID tool for whether it's a conspiracy theory or an actual conspiracy. And you can see I've got the six categories here, and I'll explain them now. So a genuine conspiracy, you've got to use a correct definition. And definitions these days are changing, even in the dictionaries. But anyway, here's the Oxford English, and they have a great definition of an actual conspiracy. And it's a combination of persons for an evil or unlawful purpose. That's fair enough. And legally, it's the crime occurs if you've got two or more persons do an illegal act or do a lawful act by unlawful means. So it's quite established, and I won't go through the last one. But that's a great definition of conspiracy. And here's another one for dictionary.com. And I don't like them putting in secret now, and Oxford didn't, because it doesn't have to be secret at all. Uh, but dictionary.com has further definitions which are similar to Oxford. Unlawful, harmful combinations of persons. He joined the conspiracy to overthrow the government uh, and legally. So they're good definitions, and definitions are important. Now, what about conspiracy theory? What's the definition for that? Well, Oxford are actually quite good. The theory that an event or phenomenon occurs as a result of a conspiracy between interested parties, uh, specifically a belief that some covert, okay, but influential agency, typically political in motivation, oppressive in intent, is responsible for an unexplained event or a current scenario. That's very good. I like it. It's fair. But the definitions elsewhere are much more manipulative. And you'll see the word secret and secret of great importance is being kept from the public. And the example here in Merriam-Webster is a secret cabal of reptilian humanoids. So you get the flavor. Conspiracy theory is a weaponized phrase and it's mostly used to discredit or shut down conversation or debate, even on a valid concern. Uh, so this has been weaponized and you've seen the last few years used extensively. So let's look now at my kind of guidelines for sorting between the two. And you got to use your brain here, sorry, but it's not going to be complex. I've simplified it a lot, I assure you. So I just did this rough definition. How do you decide it's a, maybe a real conspiracy? Well, it'll be covert, but discoverable. And you can demonstrate motive, means, and opportunity. And these are the pillars from the world of criminology. And it occurred to me I should use these. They're established. And or solid logical basis. You can demonstrate a logical reality uh, that supports that this may be a collusion. And it's inherently compatible with human geopolitical history and prior events of an analogous nature are discoverable. So it's not something that's completely out of the blue and, and just as absurd, right? So that's a fair definition and my checklist will flesh that out. Now, Hanlon's razor is important, but I'm gonna skip through that. You can free screen later and have a look at it. And there's a converse to Hanlon's razor. So you gotta be careful using Hanlon's too much or in the wrong scenario. 
Now, conspiracy theory, think again. How do you define that? Well, it would be a secret thing, or arcane secret, weird thing, or inherently absurd, or fanciful, or you cannot demonstrate motive, means, and opportunity properly, and or supply a solid logical basis for the scenario, right? And it's inherently incompatible with human geopolitical history and established data, or prior scenarios of an analogous nature don't really exist. So it's kind of weird stuff. Uh, genuinely uh, by the definition that we're going to use and you don't want to fall for this crap and also Occam's razor I won't go through it but remember there's a converse to Occam's razor too uh, that it's not always the simplest solution that fits the facts so these are things to watch out for but we won't dwell on them and we're going to start with something to test the template or the tool. So the tragic 9-11 towers collapse. And we're going to be very specific here. The so-called conspiracy we're talking about is that explosives were put in and it was a controlled demolition simultaneous with the aircraft hitting the building, I guess. Now, interestingly, I was in a wafer fab fully suited up with other engineers when this actually happened uh, many years ago. And when I looked at the footage on the screen I made the comment those towers are going to fall and the reason I made that comment is because I instinctively made some calculations and I said right there's around 20,000 gallons of jet fuel and it's igniting and the steel in the, that building steel and concrete building there's no way it's going to be able to hold the enormous weight of all the floors above so it's going to fall down and, and pancake and I just knew that looking at it, and we discussed it at the time. But then years later, this conspiracy theory came up, and that's one of the reasons I didn't really go for it at all. But let's use the checklist and see. So motive is crucial. Is there a motivation? Well, that's kind of valid in this case, because the geopolitical reward would be massive, for this event, this terrible event, because it would enable future wars, proxy wars, change in laws and the Patriot Act and surveillance and more extended power to the state and, and all these kind of spook organizations and CIA. So there is a huge motive, if you will, for this. So we can tick that box, even though it sounds terrible, it's, it's true means and i would say not credible because the complexity of such an operation and if you've ever watched documentaries on controlled building demolition and i have even for buildings 20 times smaller than the trade towers you know you're talking months with a fully uh, stripped building and completely emptied of people to actually do the demolition it it's just not credible that you have the means to pull this off i would say and i know some people would be annoyed with me but that's the way i see it i'm an engineer and that's the way i think so we'd say no the means are, are not feasible really the opportunity not credible again it ties to the above there is not an opportunity to go in and pull this off under this definition it doesn't really make sense uh, to me or I would say many people. So fair enough, I'm being honest, I, I think no. The proof of concept, the historical basis. Now this is weak. So yeah, Gulf of Tonkin and there have been false flag operations in USA, plenty. But of this scale and against, you know, American citizens knowingly committing an atrocity of this scale, it doesn't wash for me. Uh, on native soil, no. On foreign lands, by all means, and I mean Iraq, Syria, and all the other stuff, like Afghanistan, you could have all kinds of shenanigans. But, but no, it doesn't really tick the box. And logic feasibility, no, kind of covered that already. It, it, it just doesn't work for me. Propaganda and censorship, was that present? Well, not really credible. There was debunking and there was ridiculing of the theory we're describing, but there was no major censorship and no aligned collusion to shut down the conversation, not really. So it didn't really have that propaganda and censorship zeal that you'd expect from a genuine conspiracy. So it fails. Again, apologies to some people who feel strongly about this, but I'm using my sheet and using my judgment, and um, that's it. So you could say, yeah, it's a conspiracy theory, at least as it's defined here. Now, weapons of mass destruction. 
falsehoods to enable Iraq war program. Okay, you'll all be familiar with this one. But let's check it, and we all know now what the outcome was, but let's check it with the checklist. So, motive, absolutely similar to the last one. Massive reward, enabling the war, control of oil, geopolitical advantage, terrain gain, Middle East security objectives, etc. There's obviously a huge motive to drive this story or narrative to enable huge achievements. Means, yeah, USA has dominance in geopolitical sphere, clearly enables fraud at this scale, you know, huge standing in the United Nations, and we've seen it all before. So the means are there. Opportunity, well, 9 11 was a tragedy, but it gave a clear opportunity window to drive this deal home and go into Iraq and get all the objectives. So, yes, indeed, there was an opportunity, a huge opportunity, tragic though the event was. Proof of concept, historical basis. Well, this is valid also. Many proxy wars in USA's history. It's just that the scale of this fraud to enable this one was incrementally larger, but uh, perfectly within the bounds of uh, probability that it's a natural evolution in the modern world to to more audacious uh, things. So, yep, logic feasibility. Well, yeah, we can tick this box because... The idea of weapons of mass destruction may have been kind of absurd and there was a lot of challenge for a while, but at the end of the day, eminently possible to pull off, just keep banging the drum and keep pushing the narrative, and technically it was hard to prove not, so so yeah, we ticked that box. But see the next item, propaganda and censorship. Now this one, number six, You can almost call it, if this one is present in a big way, it's a very dominant uh, kind of category, Uh, but let's see what happened. Well, absolutely. The campaign and the media at the time, I was astonished to watch the news across the board in America beating war drums. I mean, we had freedom fries because the French didn't really fully support this whole thing. And it was incredible propaganda. Anyone would admit that. And censorship, yeah, several journalists, I think in the New York Times as well, might have been Chris Hedges, lost their jobs for challenging and opening up even a debate on whether this was all justified or made sense. So propaganda and censorship in spades. Tick that one. And we found out in the following years, it was, of course, a conspiracy and it was utter nonsense about the weapons. And the checklist has performed excellently on this other end of the scale. So now we'll go to one that's much more kind of current and we get to really test this checklist. And you might disagree with some of my conclusions, by all means, but I'm going to provide all the context so you can decide if the checklist is a real winner. So, COVID response, and again, we're very specific in our definition of the putative conspiracy or conspiracy theory. It's the lockdowns, masks, mandates, and the whole thing, right, in the last couple of years. Was there causal collusion, confluence of interests coming together, and essentially a conspiracy to drive this pandemic on behalf of the, shall we say, pandemic industry? That's what we're testing. So I'm now going to have to provide some data and context around each of these items as we go through and tick the boxes because we can't be glib and just tick them based on comments. So let's get into it. So I described the phenomenon of the whole COVID-19 response and how people reacted a couple of years ago and I'll just run through it briefly here. So in fairness there was huge public fear, a lot of it was stoked of course. And political drivers were driving the whole thing. That's obvious. And they were driving fear onto the people. And media drivers, mass media, legacy media drivers, were there around the clock, clearly. And that drove fear in the public. The media was driving fear in politicians, the ones who weren't already driving fear themselves, right? And there was a fear feedback from the public. As the public became fearful on the back of this they began to push their fear back on these organizations, almost demanding more. Lots of fear feedback to the politicians also, right? So you had this feedback crazy loop of growing fear and a term mass formation can be used and it just drives forward a kind of a monster, if you will. And we know that happened. 
And that was the big engine, if you will, that drove a lot of the craziness that went on. And we're not addressing this here in this conspiracy. We're testing. We know this happened and we acknowledge that this happened and it's a huge factor. But it doesn't happen all on its own. People don't go mad spontaneously. They need a trigger. The triggers came from this side of the house. So we've Neil Ferguson in Imperial College that's taken a few hundred million over the last eight years from kind of pandemic industry foundations and organizations. So maybe not too surprising that he was providing the nonsense modeling that said <laughs> we're all going to die. And that really drove governments, politicians and everything and really kicked off the mass formation. We have this guy over here, we won't say too much, but the guy's falling down the street. Remember that, the footage, the trucks, the suits, the sprays, and their so-called successful lockdown, right? So all of this was propaganda to get the West to kind of turn itself inside out. We had these guys, they were given full censorship power in February, I think, 2020. YouTube said anything they say, if you contradict it, you're gone, boy. So these kind of epitomize the leading face of the pandemic industry, essentially. You have World Economic Forum and, you know, we'll talk about that a little more soon. But they publish books on taking advantage of this pandemic pandemonium. So major uh, pandemic profiteers and achiever of strategic goals through disaster capitalism of pandemics. Uh, no real question about that. United Nations, uh, very linked to Rockefeller organizations back in the 50s and linked very much to WHO. So these are all linked together. And of course, the classic foundation, and there's more of them, and Gavi are pretty much synonymous with this. And between them, their donations to World Health are basically one of the biggest single donations if you include the two together, and you should. So the linkages here are huge. You got Big Pharma, and don't even talk to me, the tentacles of Big Pharma are everywhere, as you no doubt know, into regulatory uh, capture and all of these organizations, and intimately linked in with the foundations and WHO, of course. Uh, they're kind of bedfellows, if you will. And I won't get into this too much, but the Bank of International Settlements, the International Monetary Fund, were very clear on what they wanted from COVID, from all their publications. And they see with a you know, glint in their eye, mandatory vaccinations and passports, and ultimately a path to a mandatory a global ID card, which will be required for central bank digital currencies and many other strategies. So they were kind of salivating uh, for their own reasons and hugely influential and hugely linked into other organizations here. This is the tip of the iceberg, it goes on and on. And the linkages, as I say, you can't go through them all. They're just too myriad. One person online tried to do a massive bubble chart and it just gets unreadable. There's so many links between these guys. Uh, so I pulled this pic to represent it. So this is, this enormous kind of superstructure is the small but ultra powerful engine that essentially provides the impetus to get the mass formation rolling and to keep it rolling. Uh, that's what I would suggest. So the conspiracy we're talking about is the collusion and confluence of interests of this kind of mega block uh, driving a lot of what went on really from behind the scenes. Kind of covert, but mostly published. So we'll put aside the mass formation kind of public element, you know, the massive group think. I mean, it's there, but we're, we're not going to focus on it. And we'll touch on Rockefeller Foundation and Lockstep shortly. None of this is conspiracy. This is all just facts and published. I'll give you the link to the PDFs, but it just gives great context. And don't forget also that the massive corporations, the big ones, all knew from the start that this was a, a huge opportunity to profit. And you saw as well all their stocks go up, of course, after the pandemic started. And four trillion went from the middle classes and small businesses, half of which were shut down. Uh, four trillion went across to the wealthiest corporations and individuals. And the number of billionaires, I believe, doubled over the period of the pandemic. So all of these guys are massively into the confluence of interests also. So this is context. I won't even go through this lot, but 
you know, just think of that diagram again. The modern world, the reality is all of these guys are essentially working together in one shape or another and thinking of shared goals and shared strategies and shared opportunities for increased profit and revenue. It's just the way it is. So motive, a behemoth of all those organizations all knew from the get go that there was mega money in this thing. So absolutely tick the box. No one could deny that. So, motive is there in spades, but let's go on now to the means. Is it really feasible or can we demonstrate that all of these groups had the means together to hugely influence the trajectory of the pandemic in their favor? Uh, let's take a look. So, WHO is on the record in Forbes and elsewhere having pulled off something analogous for the swine flu. And the definition of pandemic was changed to take out the severity clause and WHO met in Geneva with a series of leaders from the pharmaceutical industry at that time and set in motion the whole vaccine thing around swine flu and it all became a debacle, but it's all on the record and they achieved a worldwide panic. Uh, not quite as big as recently, but yes. And the European Parliament even investigated and eventually it probably fizzled out a bit because there's so many influencers who don't want any trouble with this. But, you know, we can see these articles. And this one is superb, and I'll put a link down below with some other links. It's Der Spiegel magazine, and they did a huge article, and it's fascinating to read now. The Swine Flu Panic of 2009, and it goes through all the gory details. We'll mention that Klaus Schwab has published books relating to their intentions, and COVID-19, the Great Reset, came out in a flash in the middle of 2020. And these are really important bodies, I'll show you in a moment. And they basically said what would happen, what they wanted to happen, and actually what would happen. And there's a quote that's quite interesting. It kind of sums it up. The pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. Uh, yeah, in the way that you guys want. The Great Reset will require stronger governments, will demand private sector engagement every step of the way. And private sector means basically stakeholder capitalism, which means the corporates get to run the show and your politicians kind of get to be middle managers. That's it in a nutshell. Just to show you, World Economic Forum partners, and here they are, and it's basically all the big corporates are partners, and in fairness, they haven't hidden this, it's not a secret, but their Young Leaders program has groomed alliances with people who are now leading the governments in Canada, New Zealand, France, that's Macron, and all over the world. Um, in many cases, sizable minorities of the cabinets are directly out of these programs. So there you are, they've, they've done well. So we'll remind you again, we've got all these players and they're all interacted and they're all really smart people and they all really have huge goals. And they involve control, dominance, profiteering for their partners and basically everything really. <laughs> so Rockefeller Foundation and Lockstep I mentioned 2010, this is a fact, it can't be debunked because they did it. And Andrew King in April 2020, actually came out with a short thread on Twitter and ran through the basics. So I'm just going to grab some of that and I link it down below as well. And I'm not going to read through it all actually. I think I'll speed through it in deference to my audience. But you can freeze screen and see that everything that was said in this supposed kind of simulation was actually a wish list. Rockefeller and all the others were salivating for a pandemic and you could see the glint in their eye as they wrote down what they'd like to happen, the ideal kind of rollout scenario for what actually happened if there was a nasty pandemic. And it's just astonishing to read the full thing because it's just a mirror image of what actually happened. And lockstep, uh, Andrew put in the definition there. It's quite appropriate. Mode of marching in step by a body of persons going one after another as closely as possible. And I kind of showed you all the, the body of persons in previous slides. And the other definition, a standard method or procedure that is mindlessly adhered to or that minimizes individuality. There's something appropriate about that, right, after the last few years. So, event 201 I'll mention again, 
This is a fact. It happened, even though fact checkers tried to debunk that it had anything connected whatsoever to COVID-19, which is kind of funny. But Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, World Economic Forum, Johns Hopkins University. So there's probably involvement of others, but the usual, the usual suspects. The link is there. The stuff is all still up on the web. And they pull together leaders in corporates, leaders in media, uh, leaders in public health. And they did a huge simulation and hilariously, <laughs> hilariously it simulated a coronavirus epidemic could happen. And what we do, and what we do in, in this simulation was, of course, we'd have to look at censorship and controlling information and we'd have to bring in lockdowns and masks and all the usual stuff that ironically, a couple of months later, there was a coronavirus epidemic out of nowhere after 100 years. And um, there you go. It was just a fluke. It's just a fluke. Uh, interestingly, this man didn't just deny that it was connected but he, he denied really that it really happened almost and he said it had nothing to do and this was published on and it's kind of bizarre like I don't know is that some kind of psychological show or something to actually deny a huge exercise that you just threw together and funded hard to say and some people might say well you know it is a mega coincidence that all the parties came together and did a big simulation on a coronavirus out of the blue you know, pandemic, and then it happens a month or two later. And then people say, well, you know, they knew or they made the virus or whatever. But I, I think there's simpler ways of looking at it, really. So all of these guys and all of these biosecurity and pandemic profiteering spooks, they have sentinel programs where they monitor flus. And remember, they're all gagging for a flu or, or another form of pandemic for decades. So they're always looking to the east and tracking. And they would have seen like in mid-2019 or little after the summer, when it's strongly uh, believed and there's evidence this thing began to emerge, they would have been aware something's going on. So at the very least, they would know something's going on. And could say, well, let's make sure we're ready for it with censorship, masks and lockdowns. Not ready for it with medications or helping people. So there you go. And the text is here. If you just want to freeze screen, I won't read through it on the denial. So keep this all in mind as we go on with the checklist, because this is all true, accurate reality and historical context. So number two. Well, it's a, obviously, a huge array of the most influential organizations in the world have been preparing for this since the 1950s. And I'll give you a link to how far it goes back later. And there's no conspiracy theory there. I mean, it's all on the record. They've been gagging for a pandemic on the edge of their seat. So, of course, after the swine flu and we saw what happened, yeah, the means is there to pull off a massive change to the trajectory of this thing. Opportunity and proof of concept or historical basis. What about that? Well, the swine flu, and you should read this Spiegel article, is a no-brainer for those categories. But I've also supplied the link down below to a Swedish PhD who went through in an incredible 40-minute talk the full history from the 1950s from Rockefeller through Kissinger through all the other organizations, the UN, WHO, all the way up to Fauci, WEF. If you don't see that 40 minutes of actual documented history and he has all the references, you're always going to be left without context. So I highly recommend that. In short, I mean, the opportunity was obviously there. It's the biggest opportunity in history to leverage for the confluence of interests to get what they all desire. And huge preparation was put in place to exploit it to the max. And that goes back decades. So we ticked that box. Huge opportunity. And proof of concept and historical basis for this. Swine flu alone establishes the precedent in principle. But there's a deluge more of all the stuff that's gone on the past 10 or 15 years with pharma and the moving forward of a medical kind of coercion and tyranny infrastructure across the world. So yeah, the whole behemoth was well placed. Tick. Now we need to check in on logic and feasibility 
How feasible is this? Does the logic fit for this being a confluence of interests and kind of a collusion, a conspiracy of the traditional definition? Well, if you just take the example of masks alone, and I'll just show you here, Pandata have fantastic articles on the whole COVID era, and they went through one on the WHO pandemic plans. And that document is 100 pages, approx. 2019 it was published. It was the best of Western knowledge on how to manage a pandemic and the non-pharmaceutical interventions, lockdowns, masks, all that stuff. And uh, here's a summary that Abir Ballon did, and it's excellent. And it shows that the document precluded, or basically forget about it, all the measures that were suddenly brought in in 2020, which were taken direct from China. So they threw in the trash their own whole pandemic kind of playbook, which was absurd. Now, this doesn't actually show this summary masks, but masks were in the document too. And they were basically largely written off because of lack of evidence and failed RCTs. So let's look at masks as an example. This paper came out in May 2020. Although mechanistic studies support the potential effect of hand hygiene or face masks, evidence from 14 RCTs of these measures did not support a substantial effect, and that's being fair. And influenza is the same as SARS-CoV-2 in terms of transmission mechanisms and aerosol. So this applies. So we knew this, and 40 years of science said this, and everyone in the early stages of the COVID pandemic acknowledged this and said masks are useless. No, no, no need. And these examples came up and they're just hilarious. Masks and business restrictions versus none, North and South Dakota, perfect natural experiment, spot the difference in the actual viral curve. And more recently we had this. So it was known that the masks were nonsense, solidly, right, before they came in. 2020 Cochrane uh, Collaboration Library, clear as day, all the best evidence in RCTs showed there was no benefit. And this 2020 publication, early 2020, it was delayed to late 2020 uh, for whatever reason. But by then all the mandates had come in. And here we are, mandatory mass April, May, brought in when the virus had collapsed seasonally, clear as day. They were actually only brought in when the pandemic was abated until the next winter all across Western Europe. April, May, whether it was Germany, Austria, or Poland, all was the same. They came in after the pandemic was essentially gone for the summer, and they didn't change the curve whatsoever after they came in, as you'd expect from the science. Now, I would ask you, honestly, the experts who brought in the mask mandates could not not be aware that the masks were at best a trivial impact. And they also could not have been unaware that it's now the summer and the thing has collapsed and many countries had already lifted restrictions and the curve kept going down. So they knew that. They knew the game was up for the moment and they would have known that in the winter it'll come back again. So why did they choose to bring in mandatory masks with prison sentences and fines right, to bury them home. People, you've seen all the videos, people dragged out and kind of beaten up for not wearing a mask. They forced all that in when they knew it had collapsed for the summer and they knew the measures were coming out successfully and the curves were staying down. They knew that and they knew the history of the science on masks. So why did they drive them in at that point? And you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to say that that is nuts. And I think the mechanism is you've got pyramidal structures, you've got ultra influence at the top driving down through a pyramidal structure. And if you get one panel of 20 people talking about this and you have a couple of bad eggs in the panel who drive forward that masks should be done, you can actually cascade that down through the system until everyone's gone nuts. And I guess that's what happened. But in any case, it's a perfect example of the absurdity. And yet, everyone went with it. And that just shows the slam down of mandatory mass alone demonstrates the feasibility and actuality of what was pulled off for this particular a conspiracy that we're testing and all the other absurdities, and I could go through all of them, just like that one, 
they close the case. Absolutely, uh, the logic and the feasibility fits. So there we are, uh, only one left to go and it's a big one. Let's have a look. Propaganda and censorship. Now propaganda and censorship is, I mentioned earlier, if that is there in spades, it almost answers the question, right, on its own. Though you should have most of the checklist positive if you're going to prove it, but it's a powerful one. Propaganda and censorship combo, a two-hander, I always say. If that's there in a big way, it's a huge deal to tick that box. So let's now take a look at a personal example and then a wider one. So we made a movie, covidchroniclesmovie.com, and we specifically, myself and Donal, only got experts in the various areas, professor level generally. And the reason we did that is we wanted experts to be saying the stuff and then we would discuss because we knew there was censorship and we thought we'd better keep it really, really clean because we don't want all of that trouble with censorship, etc. But what happened? Even though we were clean as a whistle, and if you watch the movie, I'll give you the link in a minute, we were correct on everything, proven out over time. But it was instant removed from YouTube within a day of launch when you uploaded the movie file. The algorithm already had the movie loaded in to instant strike and delete it. That's how bad it was, guys. That's how bad the censorship was. And I was going to show you a clip where in the movie, I just discuss how one of the worst things about the whole COVID era was the censorship, the destruction of scientific open discussion and argument. And yet, I can't show you that clip because the clip from the movie might trigger the algorithm and just get a strike. That's how bad the censorship was. And the GB declaration incredible sense that came out around September 2020 and I thought thank God professors from Harvard, Oxford and Stanford are now putting on paper a logical science-based proposal around shielding the susceptible and the people who are at no risk opening up because society was being destroyed by, by the craziness of lockdowns from China. But what happened and Freedom of information, emails have come out now. Here's the Wall Street. Fauci and Collins, right? Two key players in the huge web I showed you earlier, right? The pandemic profiteering industry. They came out and private emails between them said, let's take this down. We must take this down. And that's the language of, to be quite honest, conspiracy. Uh, they weren't trying to save granny. They said, we got to take this down. This is a competing idea. We got to shut it down. And sure enough, Google then stopped it being visible in the search engine. You couldn't find it for around a week and then they backed off. But the vitriol and the pandemic industry backlash on the GB declaration, which potentially undermined their insane lockdowns, right? And masks and all that stuff that was going to give them the massive payday. It was something to behold. And there were over 60,000 signatures in GB declaration from medical practitioners and public health scientists and around a million people, right? And leaders from the top university didn't matter. They came in and they essentially killed it. So censorship propaganda, no one, even people supportive of some of the madness can say that that wasn't everywhere and it was unprecedented. So we'll tick the box, but before we do, I wanna show you a clip from just the other day, and this is February 23, and a lot of stuff is coming out now, and here's, I think, a Senate committee and a Republican senator who's grilling one of the Twitter employees who broke the law and imposed censorship of an outrageous nature. So hopefully we're gonna see a lot more of this, but here's the clip. Employee were exchanging communications on Jira, a private cloud server, with CISA, NASS, NASED, and Alex Stamos, who now works at Stanford and is a former security, of, um, security officer at Facebook to remove a posting. Do you now remember communicating on a private cloud server to remove a posting? Yes or no? 
I wouldn't agree with the character. I don't care if you agree. This, do you, this, is, this is your stuff. Yes or no, did you communicate with a private entity, the government agency on a private cloud server, yes or no? The question was if I could. Yes or no? Remotely. Yeah, I'm on time. Yes or no? Ma'am, I don't believe I can give you a yes or no. Well, I'm going to tell question. you right now that you did, and we have proof of it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is joint action between the federal government and a private company to censor and violate the First Amendment. This is also known, and I'm so glad that there's many attorneys on this panel, joint state actors. It's highly illegal. You are all engaged in this action, and I want you to know that you will be all held accountable. So you can't get clearer than that. And as I said, hopefully more and more of this will come out and the Twitter files have been explosive, but sadly, legacy media who are all in the game with the rest of them won't even cover the story. So it's a challenge. But in any case, unprecedented propaganda and censorship. Unbelievable, unthinkable before March 2020 on the back of a kind of a bad flu equivalent impact phenomenon. Uh, Take the box. It was there and it was there to an incredible degree. So there you have it. Uh, I think the checklist has worked rather well as a tool and it gives us the answer. Uh, no, it's not a conspiracy theory, right? As defined, that causal collusion and confluence of interests drove in a major way the trajectory of this thing that we all had to suffer in the last few years. It's not a conspiracy theory. No way. It's an actual conspiracy, as per the definition that we went through earlier from Oxford uh, Dictionary. So that's it. I hope this tool will be very useful uh, for you, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion of facts which supported filling out the template. And I'm going to put the template in the link down below, a PowerPoint template, so you can pick your supposed conspiracy theory and go through the data like an engineer, like a problem solver, and actually structure your thinking and be honest and say, is it an actual conspiracy or collusion? Or in fairness, is this particular thing, whatever it is, more of a conspiracy theory that really doesn't fit? And separating the two is becoming increasingly important in today's world. So all of the conspiracy theories, or almost all of them over the past three years, have actually turned out to be true. So big points for the conspiracy theorists. Uh, but going forward, we'll see more and more fact checking and trying to subvert or kind of overturn or work against actual collusion and conspiracies by calling them conspiracy theories. So hopefully you find the template useful and you enjoyed this. And as always, a huge thanks to my Patreon and PayPal supporters. That's what enables me to keep countering the absurdity of the legacy media narratives. Uh, they've gotten so comical at this stage, you could almost laugh, but they're seriously uh, misinformation and disinformation, genuinely, as opposed to the stuff they like to call that. And really appreciate anyone else who can jump in and keep me on this kind of investigative reporting and clarifying scientific and logical points and just providing some sanity against the torrent of, of nonsense that we're all subjected to and our friends and family are subjected to and, and can't really deal with and then come back to us and say, oh, it's a conspiracy theory. Uh, you know, it's very frustrating, as I'm sure many of you are well aware. So thank you.